Becky Fine is the founder of the Powerful Voice Project, which works to help victims of sexual assault recover. She found that organization. She was the last organization, her organization was the last organization in Sonoma County to put on the vagina monologues. And she's now working in student mental health. She's a powerful woman from our community, and she's going to stand up, and she's got some things to share with you. Please give her your full attention. Thanks. Every woman that I know has had some form of harmful sexual experience in her life. For some, it was rape. For some, incest, molestation, intimate partner violence, harassment in the workplace, and for all, harassment in the street is commonplace. I've heard their stories because I've made it my life's work to speak up, to listen, to ask questions, and to support. With that background, the story that Dr. Christine Blasey Ford recounted in front of Congress a few weeks ago of being sexually assaulted was very familiar. The details of the terror she experienced, so familiar. The aftermath and the post-traumatic stress ever since, so familiar. She's not alone. Many of us have been there and have felt that way too. I was stunned by the congressional proceeding that surrounded Kavanaugh's confirmation to the Supreme Court, overwhelmed by the courage of Dr. Ford and shaken to my core by the line of questioning from some of the senators on the committee. But what struck me the most about her testimony was the story about her second front door. Dr. Ford recounts that several years ago, she and her husband were doing a major remodel of their home, and she was insistent that there needed to be a second front door. Her husband was confused and inquired, why would we need two front doors? What house needs a second front door in it? It was only then, decades into their marriage, that she told her husband that she'd been assaulted as a young adult. She needed that second front door to feel safe in her home and to protect herself from the terror of that night at the party when she had to walk downstairs after being assaulted through the living room where her perpetrators were sitting to get out through the only front door. A second front door could have protected her from that horrific experience. There was so much about her testimony that resonated me, with me. But that second front door really got me thinking. What are the things that I do, logical or illogical, to protect myself because of my rape? What are the experiences and connections that I've held myself back from because they didn't feel safe? What are my second front door stories? While all of this was happening in con Congress, I was spending some time with a close friend of mine, someone who knew me well at the time that I was raped. We were talking about the second front door and I asked him, I said, do you remember back in college when I stopped hanging out as much? Do you remember how I would leave before it got dark and I would plan my exact route home before leaving your house? He said, yeah, you know, I remember a big drop in the amount of time we got to spend with you that year. We all assumed that you'd gotten busy with classes or something. I told him, newly empowered with this language, that was one of my second front door stories. It took me years to be okay hanging out after dark. I was terrified I wouldn't make it home because the night that it happened to me, I was on my way home and it was dark. 
In 2011, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention published the first major piece of research around sexual violence. The results were so immense, so extreme, that the CDC officially deemed sexual violence a public health epidemic. It revealed that one in five women will experience rape in her lifetime. One in five. And that most of that happens before the age of 24. We all know someone who's been sexually assaulted, whether we know it or not. Yet today, in 2018, we have not one, but two sitting Supreme Court justices of the United States with credible accusations of sexual assault or harassment on the record. These men were hired by Congress to the most powerful job in our country in the face of these women's stories. And then we have a president who mocks our stories to what end? to silence us, to wield power and control over our voices, our stories, and our bodies. It's exhausting. I'm exhausted by the relentless attacks on our humanity, our credibility, and our bodies. And on the other hand, I'm also energized. Through all of this, we're seeing stories pouring through the, the seams like never before. Men standing in solidarity and speaking out with other men. Nuanced conversations about sexual assault, oppression, and privilege. I'm inspired by the tidal wave of stories, support, and rising awareness. They want us to back down because they are afraid of our power. We will not be quiet about this anymore. We will not be polite or accommodating anymore. No matter how hard they try to break us down, silence us, we will hold our sisters in their healing, our collective trauma, and we will rise. There is no going back from where we are now. That Me Too consciousness will only grow. So today, when you leave here, talk to somebody about how the Kavana confirmation impacted you. Ask them how it's impacting them. And involve the men in your life. Support them in truly understanding the deep and traumatic wounds that this reopens in our minds and in our bodies. And men, our partners, fathers, brothers, friends, we need you to show up, to use your strength, your privilege, your sense of safety in the dark, to stand up to sexism. Stand up to those violence and aggression that you witness among men. Stand up and show us your love your respect, and your absolute intolerance of the systematic perpetration of violence against us. And listen, when you don't know what else to do, listen and believe us. Clear the paths for us to speak, build the stages so we can be heard, and hold us when it gets too damn heavy a load to bear. Learn about and grieve with us over our second front door stories. This is all of our battle to fight. We each play a role. None of us thrives under the weight of these human injustices. And the injustices are surfacing. Sharing our stories and listening to those who are marginalized and systematically silenced is, in my opinion, the most critical piece of this puzzle. So I am grateful to all of us for being here and taking the time to learn and create this conversation. Now, let's amplify it because we have a lot of work to do. Thank you.